So, uh, before starting, I would like to say, you know, I'm speaking from a quite specific perspective as an, um, as an observer of what we call uh, the emerging field of peer production. So, this is a form of value creation and distribution where uh, communities of contributors create shared pools of knowledge, which can be text, code, and design and can be connected to the production of free software, open design, open hardware, and distributed manufacturing. So this is a very specific point of view. Uh, I'm also a Westerner, so I, you know, I have all these biases from growing up in a Western country, um, despite my 15 years in Thailand. So um, here's what I want to start with. The first point I would like to make is, uh, by the way, that this contributory economy has been estimated in the U.S. to be one-sixth of GDP in the fair use economy reports. So this is all the economic streams around shared knowledge pools and about 17 million workers uh, are involved in this economy. And But peer production is part of this. Uh, you have pre-existing pools that are given out by the government like geographic information and then you have co-created co pools like Wikipedia, Linux, Arduino. Okay, so here's the first point. And this is a kind of a, a, a contradiction within peer production. Even though it's based on open and free contributions, this means that there are no structural impediments to participation in that system itself. It's theoretically open. In practice, of course, uh, the outside structures determine who is actually able to contribute. So it's the, uh, you know, the societal structures, the educational achievements, class, gender issues that determine who is actually able to contribute uh, to a system of peer production. So this is the first uh, point I want to make. It's not because the system is fully open theoretically and, you know, anybody can input that this is actually true in, in practice because uh, peer production has to operate within an existing social structure. Um, and it cannot be expected that peer production communities are fully able to solve these outside issues, right? So, for example, if you take a free software community, uh, because most software developers are male at this stage still, they create a male culture. Uh, and this male culture can then in the... In, can then in turn reinforce uh, cultural barriers to uh, female participation. So this is just an example of an issue that may arise within a peer production community. And we should also stress that even though these communities produce commons, in other words, not commodities, but commons, fully shareable uh, common pools of knowledge, code and design, that they do not necessarily have a vision of the outside society. So these commons can be quite selfish and oblivious of social and environmental externalities. They, are, they don't have a, a solution for this or even necessarily a willingness to tackle these issues by themselves. Um, so uh, Another point I would like to make is if, if we want inclusion in this particular context, there is an issue of what I would call layered uh, peer production literacy. So it's not enough just to have you know, a generic education. It's not enough to have access to technology. There are many cognitive uh, requirements that come on top of that basic uh, capacity. So. Um, you need to work on a layered literacy, not just a basic technological access and, you know, a generic ability to use a computer. It's a bit more complex than that. Uh, but I think it's important that we think about this because peer production is a rapidly emerging uh, part of our economies that wherever it, it, it usually appears in a private economy, it tends to displace the older models. As you as you can see with Wikipedia displacing um, the Britannica, and as you can see in free software, where it's almost impossible now to get funding from venture capital if you don't have an open policy. 
So these are important things uh, to consider. Now, within this, this is my second point. Now, within this context, I was asked to to do a, a rather ambitious project in Ecuador called the Flock Society project, in which Flock means Free Libre Open Knowledge Society. Uh, so three government institutions asked us there to create a tra transition proposals uh, to create a, a society and an economy which is modeled on shared pools of knowledge. So you would have an open education commons, an open science commons, an open agricultural commons, an open industrial commons. The knowledge for these economic and social activities would be shared and the economy that would be built would be based on that shared knowledge rather than proprietary knowledge. So this is of course a uh, an ambitious plan and I don't have time to evaluate it here how it went and what the potential is but it was an ambitious plan and it did produce a commons transition plan which I invite people to look into uh, later on if you have time because it's the first time this has been done. Now in order to achieve this given my first remark about you know, the, the potential exclusionary nature of peer production it's not because you have shared knowledge pools in a society that automatically the egalitarian and emancipatory uh, potential is realized. So the way that we solved, that we proposed to solve this was to look at the material and immaterial conditions for participation in these knowledge pools. And I want to give you some examples of uh, Am I back? Yes, yes, you're back. Uh, uh, that. It's usually quite good connection here. Okay, so we looked at fa at feeding mechanisms such as access to scientific literature for free, which was, of course, uh, hardly the case today anymore, and how to achieve uh, uh, access. But let me focus on, on here a material condition as an example. As you may know, if you switch from proprietary hardware to open hardware, the costs go down by about seven eighth. So typically, studies of open hardware show that for the same type of machinery, you can produce them in open hardware for one eighth of the cost of proprietary hardware. So let's apply this to scientific laboratories. If you transform a scientific laboratory based on proprietary scientific hardware, to open hardware, open scientific hardware, you can have seven times more scientific labs in your country. This is, has been studied by Joshua Pierce in his book Open Source Labs. So you can actually have a policy in a country where you can greatly increase the participation in an open access science by paying attention to the material conditions such as changing from proprietary to open hardware and you can have potentially huge inclusionary effects. So this is an example of what could be done in this type of open policy. Now another example is open agricultural machining. Uh, we were working with the mayor of Sitjos, the third poorest district of uh, Ecuador and he was committed to this project and already bought a 2,200 hectare uh, public domain land to do open agricultural experimentation. So here's the, here's the situation. The local indigenous farmers in Sitges have every year less and less access to income uh, because of the globalized um, trade in agricultural products and the competition from Colombia, at least that's what, you know, they tell them uh, as an excuse to give them less and less income every year. And they have subsistence agriculture, but they don't have access to any machinery uh, that would be appropriate technology for their highly uh, sloped uh, agricultural lands. You know, they're quite vertical land there in the Alpine regions of Ecuador. So what if we would create a connection with 
open agricultural design communities that already exist, like FarmHack or the Atelier Paysan community in France, and many others. And these are communities of, agri of farmers, citizen scientists, and scientists who collectively develop agricultural machines. If you could combine this with a micro factory setting in sick jobs, and I know this would create, you know, this would require quite a cultural translation effort, but you could potentially create this exchange between the local experience of the young farmers in sick jobs and this availability of open agricultural machining that could be domestically produced in the district itself without dependency on the big agribusiness producers. So here's another example, I think, of a material condition that could be favorable to inclusion in a network society and network production. Okay, let me give you now an immaterial example. I give you an American example. Huffington Post, which most of you may know. So these are journalists producing for free to a citizen, a citizen journalist uh, platform. When that platform was sold by Ariana Huffington, she sold it for, I think, $360 million. And the free labor of the journalists went unpaid and stayed unpaid. So this is a typical example of a capture by private owners of a public resource where people are freely contributing uh, journalism in this particular case. And so this is a generic issue within peer production that free labor can be exploited and captured by proprietary platforms. Uh, so is there any solution to this? Can we create an income for contributors without commodifying the commons, without creating labor for capital? This is, the, this is the issue as we see it. And the answer is yes, we may do this by something called open value accounting. Now, open value accounting is a system that recognizes and measures all the contributions to the commons in a contributory system and tries to create an estimated value for it. Now, in this in this context, I'll tell you just what we do in the P2P Foundation itself. So we have a community of contributors. Are my 12 minutes up? Uh, just no. one or two minutes, yeah. Okay, two minutes. So I'll, I'll finish with this. So we have a community of contributors. We have a foundation, uh, an institution that as most uh, free software uh, communities have. And we have an entrepreneurial coalition, so we have a P2P cooperative. With, within that P2P cooperative, we have a translation arm. Now, when, that tra when these translators work on the market, they reserve 25% of their income for the contributory mechanism. So this is very important. The people in a peer production system who actually successfully operate a cooperative activity on the marketplace and create a livelihood. They're doing this on top of a whole system of contributions which co-creates the value. But it is now possible to put a, some value aside, in our case 25%, to fund the contributory system in return. And so this creates a fair contract within our open cooperative that is one of the weapons against exclusion and capture uh, of network contributions that we try to apply. Okay, so I'll, I'll conclude here. Uh, we have a specific strategy, and I don't have time to explain it, but just very, very short before concluding. We believe it's very important to create a new type of licensing for peer production that is not fully open like the existing GPL and other types of licensing but it's based on reciprocity. So it re requires from the members of the network to, re to contribute something to the network as well. So you cannot create a for-profit capture without contributing back to the network and the, and the contributors to the network. Um, so this is, uh, I think, uh, something that you may think about later on. 
is uh, we call these commons based reciprocity licenses and we are very engaged in promoting the use of this new type of licenses uh, within network production to create inclusionary coalitions of ethical entrepreneurs and so here's this here's a solution that we propose you are a commoner you are a peer producer you contribute to a network but instead of depending for your livelihood on for-profit companies, you create your own network of open cooperatives, which are governed by a new social charter based on reciprocity. So this makes the market internalize externalities. It takes into account social and environmental externalities and internalizes that reciprocity within a new type of ethical market that emerges around the commons. I hope this is all not too, too new for you and not too complicated. Uh, but anyway, these are the kind of things we're working on in order to achieve this kind of convergence between the rapidly emerging open production and the need for an ethical economy that goes uh, with it and that takes into account inclusion and exclusion effects. Thank you. Thank you.